Well, hello, Cove Church. So great to be with you as we continue today in our series that we're calling Tightrope, a series all about exploring the, the tensions of faith. And uh, I'll start us off with a, a story. I can remember uh, a few years ago going to a conference, uh, you know, pastor's conference, that sort of thing. And I went, ended up at a luncheon uh, where they were honoring missionaries. And missionaries had come from around the globe and were in this place for, for this particular service and luncheon. And I, it, was, it was a wonderful thing, you know, honor the missionaries that have served on the field so faithfully for so many years. There was missionaries, as I recall, from Africa, other places. And I remember uh, watching as these dear saints uh, were, their names were called and they were brought up onto the platform. And, and it was painful to watch them just get there, just the walking to the platform. It, it took a really long time. They had several people assisting several of them just to, to walk there. Um, they got to the platform, then to get up the steps, it was like a whole nother ordeal. There's lots of walkers involved and canes, and there's, there's lots of, of things that they're working through to get onto the platform. The process took a really, really long time. They get onto the platform. They say many, many wonderful things about these missionaries, very well-deserved, wonderful things, how they had sacrificed and, and, and how God had used them uh, to impact those countries. And then, of course, they, they prayed for them, a blessing on them for all that they had poured out and all that they had done. But then they did something that surprised me. They began to pray for them as they were going to send them back out. I mean, wait a minute, these folks, I just watched how they got onto this platform. We, we can't send them back out. They've, they've done enough. They've done so much. They're, they're spent. But the prayer was, yes, God, and as they go back to Africa, bless them as they continue in this ministry. And I found myself thinking, wait a minute. They, they, they can't even walk down the, the hallway of the Holiday Inn. We're going to send them to walk the jungles of Africa again? When do we say enough is enough? When do we say, you know, folks, you've done it. Well done. Here's your reward. When do we allow them to, to stop pouring out and maybe to be poured into? I know that their hearts were strong and dedicated, but I also know that they had lived their lives in service to others, and it was obvious that the vehicle that was used for that, their bodies, it was breaking down before our eyes. They were spent. And it seemed to me, just watching from the outside, that the years of care for others had also been combined with years of neglect for themselves. And I was sad to see that. And honestly, I was a little bit shocked to see it. But then the more I thought about, the less surprised I became. Because it's a picture of the tightrope that all of us walk. This tightrope between self-care and compassion. How much I pour out and how much I allow to be poured into my life. See, in the book of Matthew, chapter 22, there's a passage we speak of often because it's Jesus' response to the question of, of what's the most important commandment. And Jesus in his response actually quotes a passage from the Old Testament, from the book of Leviticus. And it boils down to this truth, love God and love people. But in the details of that response, we see Jesus actually describe the tension of faith that we're gonna to discuss today. How do I show kindness to others and also show kindness to myself? Matthew 22, 37, here's the passage. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Now get this. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself as yourself, meaning love and care for your neighbor in the same way that you love and care for yourself. This is the golden rule, right? Treat others as you want to be treated. And the assumption is always this, treat others good because obviously we treat ourselves good. And I believe that that is a flawed premise. 
I don't believe we love ourselves well often. I think most of us, if we were to listen to our own self-talk, just the way we talk to ourselves, we would never speak to another person the way we talk to ourselves. Sadly, what can often be true is that the most mean and judgmental and impatient comments that originate from us find their ultimate target in our own minds and our own hearts. They're pointed at us. Or still, at other times, <clears throat> we would never tell others that God sees them the way we think God sees us. We would never tell another person, oh, God's frustrated with you or God's angry with you or God, God's fed up with you. God has had it with you. But we'll say that to ourselves. God feels that way about me. I think for many of us, we are really good at pointing out our own failures, pointing out our own weakness, often to the denial of our own value. You know, this last week, Paul and I did another project. I guess I mostly did this one, um, but she was, you know, there supporting me. And it was uh, replacing a chandelier, which involved electrical stuff. And, um, and I was able, you know, YouTube was a good friend and we were able to do the stuff. There's the process of all the brackets and stuff that come up after it, after you replace your chandelier and where the wire goes and what it's supposed to go through. And if you don't get it right, you have to undo the wires and redo the whole thing again. I did that Six times, <laughs> six times I had to undo it and do it in because I, these, these subtle differences, these little changes, I had to do it over and over again. And, and for me, I had to remind myself that even though I failed those six times, I wasn't ultimately a failure. See, that's where my mind wants to go, though. Look at you, you're a failure. Because that's how I've seen me at times. And I've even assumed that God agreed with me. Couple that with the, the drive that all of us feel to care about other people. We want to care about other people. We know God wants that for us because that's what God's people do. But it, it can easily move past compassion and into guilt. That my doing for them makes me feel better about me. And in that, it becomes easy to find ourselves giving out so much that we have nothing left. I think of teachers in the school system. I think of nurses. I think of first responders, these groups of people that we're hoping to show kindness to as a church this year. They're difficult roles because they're all about others, and that can get wearisome because the job's never done, right? And so much of that applies to our life. So many things like that are true for us. I used to think like, like a candy store should be the greatest job you could ever work at. To work at a candy store, you're like Santa Claus all the time. I'm here delivering candy to people. But then I've encountered candy stores where the workers are grumpy. It was, it was amazing to me. Like, how can you be grumpy? This is the greatest place. This is candy. How can you possibly be grumpy? But it's probably because they're still serving others. And maybe all that serving ultimately drained them. They had nothing left. See, it's so easy to continue to pour water out for others and ultimately see our own lives become a desert. Yes, you're serving, but we know it's coming from the bottom of an empty bucket. The needs are so great out there, but we start to neglect the needs in here, in our own hearts, our own souls. Now, don't get me wrong, there are many times when we need God to inspire us about what it means to care about other people. Absolutely, we need that kind of inspiration because I can at times be very selfish and I need to repent of those things. But on this other hand, I've seen the brokenness 
that is created from a life that is so bent on the support of others that it actually breaks down in burnout and in sickness and in exhaustion. That is also not God's best. Why? Because we can become so dedicated in caring for our neighbor that we do so at the expense of ourselves. And thus what was supposed to be this full life of effective service, it becomes an ongoing cycle of striving and fatigue and despair, ultimately falling short of God's design. So I don't think our problem is only that we don't care well for people. It's also that we don't care well for ourselves. Hence the tension, hence the tightrope. Love your neighbor as yourself. How do we do both? So I'm really glad you asked. That's what we're going to talk about today. How do we walk this tightrope between self-care and compassion? We'll, we're going to gain some insight into that by looking at how Jesus did it, because we will never find a better example than Jesus. That's going to lead us to the book of John today and some helpful truths regarding the tension that we all feel. And the first truth of the tightrope is this. Respond to others with what you have. Let's look at John chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Read it together. Big voices right where you are. Go. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee. That is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already knew what he had in mind that he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? So here is one side of the chasm that we're going to cross over today. This is one end of the rope that is going to be held in tension. And it begins with this truth. God loves to use what's already in our hand. Okay? In this passage, the problem is presented. All these folks are out here and they're, they're listening to Jesus. They're experiencing healing. A great crowd is there. And Philip is like, okay, where are we going to buy food for all these folks to eat? And that's the question that Jesus brings up. And I want you to see the assumption in the statement from Philip, where shall we buy food? The assumption is this, Jesus, we know you want to take care of these people, but we also know that care can't possibly come from us. <laughs> we got to get it from somewhere else. I mean, obviously it's not going to come from us. Philip is saying, okay, we got to go on a food run here somewhere. I mean, someone's going to have to, to run to Falafel Bell or maybe Chickpea Filet or, or Hummus King of Kings, one of those places, and you're going to have to pick up some food. We got to go get it, right? Isn't that what, what we have to do, Jesus? That's the assumption, and it's a wrong assumption. See, and we see that because it's played out. Simon Peter's brother, Andrew, pipes up. Hey, I, I got this kid. I'm envisioning him. He's got the kid in a headlock. He just, I've stole his lunch money. I got him. I got him. Hey, kid, thanks for the lunch. Hey, why don't you go find something to eat for yourself now? Thanks a lot. Andrew is probably a total bully. That's what I'm envisioning. I don't know. It might have been like that. It might not have been like that. Maybe the kid just offered it up. But anyway, the point is this. Philip assumed the help would come from the outside. Jesus was calling him to bring help from the inside. Here's what I've given you. Now use it to help others. See, God often starts with what's in our hand, with what we're willing to leverage, with what we're willing to let go of, with what we're willing to give. 
Regardless of how these five loaves and two fish came to be in their care, those seven items just became ground zero for a miracle because they were in their hand. Some of you know this story. I, I came to Jesus uh, through campus life in high school, so I didn't know a lot about church. I hadn't been around church a lot. Even when I went to college, I hadn't been to church tons, but I, I, I knew my relationship with Jesus was real and important. So I went to the University of Oregon. I went there uh, for a year and a half. So I was in my, my second year of school there, and I was just I was living in a co-op house just right up the street on 18th Street here. Um, I was uh, living there. I was going to school. I had no idea why I was there. I didn't know what my purpose was. I was trying to play music. I was trying to do a few different things, but just really had no idea why I was there. I walk um, downstairs one day into the, the big dining hall that we had there. And I, um, there's this big old table, and on the table was uh, the Register Guard newspaper. And it was open to an article about a Bible college here in town that I'd never heard of, called Eugene Bible College. And it was just down on the west side of Eugene on Bailey Hill Road. And I read that article, and I was, I was like, huh, I wonder if that's what I'm supposed to do with my life. And so I called him. And I began to talk to him about what I was thinking, that I was loved Jesus and was just kind of wondering if I was supposed to move that direction. And in talking, they discovered that I played drums and played in bands a lot and did that sort of thing. And they said, well, it just happens that our touring group is needing a drummer right now. They just lost their drummer somehow. I don't know what happened. Farming accident. I don't know. I don't know what happened. But they needed a, a drummer. And uh, they said, why don't you come and practice with them? You know, just give it a try. So I came over and I practiced with them. And, and after the practice, they said, hey, we're going to a church this weekend. Why don't you come with us? And we're going to minister at a church. Why don't you come and, and join us? I said, OK. So after that experience, they're like, hey, you know, it's great having you here. You should probably come to school here. <laughs> and that was what got me in the door. Now, it was what I had in my hand, wasn't it? Drums was what I had in my hand. That's what God used to get me through that place. Now, drums is not nearly as big a part of my life now as it was then, but God used it to start me on a path, a path that would ultimately lead me to my wife, Paula, lead us to having kids, lead us to planting churches. So here's the takeaway. God uses what is in our hands to set us on a path to his heart. Great example of this is the story of Moses in Exodus chapter 4. Moses is hearing God call him to deliver Israel. And Moses is saying, God, what if they don't believe me? They don't have any reason to, to think that I'm anything special. What if they don't believe me? And God's response was, was this, what's that in your hand? <laughs> and Moses is like, this? This is my, my shepherd's staff. It's just a stick. You know, I, I, this is, I, I carry this with me every day. I use it to like push the sheep around and help me, you know, climb on stuff. It's, it's just a stick. It's nothing special. And God says, take it and throw it on the ground. And so Moses is like, okay, I'll throw it on the ground. And immediately it becomes a snake. Now, that's scary on a lot of different levels. One, that the, the stick just changed into something else. Two, that it became a snake, which is scary on its own because snakes, we all know, are super scary. So it becomes all that, and he's like, whoa, and then he grabs it, and it turns back into a stick. An amazing miracle. God used what was in Moses' hand to lead him towards what was in God's heart. And the same will always be true of us. Because God loves to use what's already in our hands. See, our response to the needs around us should never be, well, someone else should really be doing something about that. Why? Because oftentimes, that someone is supposed to be us. That there is a reason that God has allowed you to see that need because you are actually called to be a part of the solution. The answer to that prayer. Just like the food for this crowd. The miracle may not start from somewhere else because the miracle is supposed to start with us right here. So, respond to others with what you have. 
Allow your resources to be used and multiplied, not just received and consumed. That's the one side of this tension. That's the one end of this tightrope. Here's the other, okay? And it's this. Rely on Jesus for what you lack. Rely on Jesus for what you lack. Let's continue the passage, John 6. Let's read it together. Big voices, go. Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Let's um, drive the other stake into the ground, securing the other side of this tightrope, okay? Once we've done all the work that we can do, that's the, the first side, we then trust Jesus to do the work that we can never do. That's the other side of the tightrope. I love the picture here of them saying, Jesus, here's this little bit of resource that we have to bring you. I mean, I love how, just how comical that idea was. Talk about a, a cheerful or hilarious kind of giving. We're talking, it just said 5,000 men, we're talking of upwards of, of 12,000 to 15,000 people, women and children included there. And so here they are, can you imagine? Here's, here's, here's how you can picture it. Imagine standing in the middle of Matthew Knight Arena and it's at full capacity. Their capacity there is, is a little over 12,000 at Matthew and Arena. Full capacity. You're in the middle of Matthew and Arena. And the goal is to feed everybody in that place. And what do you have? A happy meal. <laughs> Standing in the middle, I got this happy meal. We're going to feed everybody in here with this happy meal. Okay, maybe it's a little bit better. It's a bag of groceries, okay? It's five loaves of birdseed bread from Metropole Bakery and two orders of deep fried cod from Newman's. That's what you have in a grocery bag. And you stand at the center court with the microphone and you say, this is what we're gonna use to feed all of you. Everybody's gonna get some. It's comical. It almost doesn't even count as a legitimate starting point. Yet to Jesus, it's never about what we have. It's about what we're willing to give. And among the most life-giving things they give up to Jesus in this moment is found in their willingness to give up control. Here's the loaves and the fish, Jesus. But it's Jesus who takes it and who gives thanks for it and who gives it away, distributes it to the people. Can you imagine how devastating it would have been if the disciples had tried to figure out how to share five loaves and two fish with 15,000 people? The only option I can possibly think of for doing that would be to take the loaf of bread and to tell everyone they can get one lick and then pass it down. And you can imagine after about 30 people, it's just like this cream of wheat ball on the end of a stick that's just disgusting. And not only is everyone still hungry, but they all have mono at that point. It would be gross. It would be a failure. It would have been a disaster for the disciples to try to figure out how to do that. So they didn't. <laughs> they gave up control. Here, Jesus, take the little we have. Whatever you want to do with it, that's great. Take it. Do what only you can do. They gave up control. The question is, can we? Do we truly believe that Jesus is enough for every single person? And that Jesus can actually do more than we could ask or imagine? If that's true, then it is not my job to make the miracle happen. It is my job to get out of the miracle's way. And this, friends, is a very freeing way to live. 
This allows me not to have to carry the weight of responsibility that I so easily try to put on myself. If this passage is any indicator, and I think it is, all I can really do with others is invite them, hey, why don't you have a seat on this mountainside because Jesus is going to come by and give you some food. My job is to say, have a seat. Jesus is coming. That's my responsibility. See, the problem that is made clear to us as we walk on this tightrope between caring for others and caring for ourselves is this. It's that we think we can save people and we can't. We think we have what they need and we don't. We can only offer an invitation to the one who does. I'm convinced that Jesus would never have had to tell us to, to pick up his yoke that's easy and his burden that's light. He would have never had to tell us that if we didn't often pick up a yoke that is difficult and a burden that is heavy. And what Jesus is saying to you today is you don't have to carry that. That weighty responsibility that in your care for others, you don't have to kill yourself. Jesus is saying, yes, you get to give that small thing that I have asked you to give. Yes, give that in freedom. Give it joyfully. But then trust me to make that small thing great. You get to replace your sense of responsibility with a greater sense of reliance. Reliance on Jesus. That, friends, is the other side of this tightrope. Rely on Jesus for what you lack. That's the second thing. Here's the last thing. Restore yourself in what God says. John 6 is the passage. Let's continue. Let's finish it out here. It says, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Here's the amazing thing about Jesus. For most of us, if 15,000 people say, hey, we want to make you king, our response is, that sounds great. Good idea. Yeah. We live in a world of celebrity, do we not? So that sounds really good to us. I mean, growing up for me, we had basically three kinds of celebrities. You, you had uh, actors and musicians and sports people, three kinds of celebrities. Now we have all of those, plus we have celebrity chefs and we have celebrity home designers, and we have celebrity YouTubers, and celebrity politicians, and celebrity influencers, and celebrity models, and celebrity pastors. We have all of that. All people who in some way, at some point, had a crowd gather around them, and that crowd said, we want to make you king. We want to make you queen. And in response, they said, okay. Now, there's no judgment in it. No, no judgment at all. It's just a reflection of our culture. We love celebrities, right? We love kings and queens. But I'm fascinated by Jesus' response to the crowd's request. He just left. It's like first century ghosting. Just, he gone. Where'd he go? I don't know. He's not picking up. I don't know. He withdraws to a mountain by himself. No crowd, no crown, just Jesus and Jehovah. He didn't take the bait. This is important for us because our culture conditions us to, to make us think that the crowd is always right and the crowd is always good. So it tells us, listen to the crowd. Well, tell that to the crowd that later gathered for the crucifixion of Christ. Many of the folks gathered there were probably here on this very day eating this bread and this fish that was broken from the hands of Jesus. On that day, the crowd spat on Jesus and mocked him. Was the crowd right that day? 
You know, the truth is this. The crowd is seldom right and never enough. Well, you say, well, I, I don't have to worry about that, and the voice of the crowd. I, I, don't, I don't have a life that, I'm, uh, that, that matters to me. Well, I would say I beg to differ for this reason. Part of the tension that we all have to manage in our lives is the constant onslaught of voices that are vying for our attention. Spouse, parent, coworker, boss, friend, employee, neighbor, teacher, government. Add to that the voice of the media, the newsfeed, the blog, the pod podcast. It is a crowd. Whether you're introverted or extroverted, whether you're highly connected or not so much, no matter who you are, like Jesus, we are surrounded by the voices of the crowd. And here's what Jesus knew. The crowd can't fulfill you. All those voices, they can't fulfill you. And the crowd won't get it right. They will miss the timing. They will miss the motive. They will miss the purpose. Jesus knew that. Jesus knew the crowd can't make you who you're supposed to be. Jesus knew the crowd can't make you do what you're supposed to do, and the crowd can't make you enough. Only God can do that. And so if we live our lives to somehow try to fulfill the needs and desires of every voice that makes its way into our life, we will eventually find ourselves empty either fighting to keep our status or mourning the loss of it. And there are enough examples of celebrity suicides to prove to us the crowd is never the answer. So what does Jesus do? Jesus leaves the crowd. Leaves the crowd to seek the king. He leaves the mob to seek the master. The question is, will we? This is the only way that we can navigate the tightrope of a world that is filled with voices of expectation. All of them saying, you should think this way, or you should vote this way, or, or you should be this way. We can only get through that gauntlet by responding just as Jesus did, I'm going to go and be with the great I am instead of hanging out with a bunch of I shoulds. I'm going to get myself where I can hear what God is saying. You know, at my gym, it's always loud music uh, when we're working out, but I have friends in the gym, and so sometimes we'll want to catch up or we'll be in the middle of a conversation when things will start and, and so we'll want to keep talking somehow but it's super loud and so in order to keep talking we'll end up like like doing push-ups like face to face in front of each other and we're, we're talking and doing push-ups at the same time all the while all we can hear is you know funky comedina and Stacy's mom evidently has it going on that's going on all the time uh, over the top of these conversations and so you just have to get close enough to each other to be able to, be able to hear over all the noise. You, you have to get close enough to each other to hear above the crowd, the voices. Reminds me of this. Each of us has to get close enough to hear the king over the crowd. Because the crowd will never be enough. Only God is. So amidst all of the voices around us, could we just decide that we're going to place ourselves where we can hear, where we can hear the voice of the great I am? Would, would you go to whatever your version is of a mountain by yourself? And would you hear the voice of the one who loves you perfectly? Restore yourself in what God says. That's the last thing, and I'll wrap up with this. 
I've never met a person who likes directions. <laughs> I, I'm typically fairly optimistic, probably too much so, fairly positive. I've got a can-do attitude, at least until something goes wrong, then I kind of fall apart. But at least up to that point, I, I think I can do it. I don't, I don't need directions, you know. The only, the only manual I need is Emmanuel, you know, that, that kind of thing. How hard could it be? But in my life, after many frustrating results, I've realized not only is it okay to take advantage of the information given to me in the form of directions, it's also very wise to do so. It goes so much better, and I end up so much better when I do that. I can learn a great deal from those who see more clearly. Friends, your life is far too valuable to tarnish because of a choice to live without the wisdom available to you. And here's the wisdom available today. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's God's wisdom telling us we need to trust God in how to do both of those things. How to, yes, show compassion to those around me, but also how to show equal compassion to myself. Tear on either side is to miss God's heart, and we don't have to. We can respond to others with what we have, and we can rely on Jesus for what we don't, and we can be restored in the presence of God Almighty. We can be filled. Maybe you feel like you're on that tightrope. And maybe you feel like you've gotten out of balance on one of the sides. Maybe you've been living life, you're giving so much out that you just feel empty inside. Or perhaps your life has been spent just looking out for yourself, just looking out for number one to the point where you've stopped even seeing others. All you can think about is you. God wants to bring you back into balance today. Trusting that as you seek God amidst that tension, God will help you take step upon step closer to Him. Let's pray. Thank you.